transmission problems and it's not fully recorded. Um, Okay, today the topic is the subject of magnetic resonance that the chemists love, namely NMR spectroscopy. So um, in the first half, we're gonna address the questions on how we can use the Bloch equations to describe the effect of T1 on the magnetization. As part of that comes the question of how can the sensitivity be optimized? And then in the second half of the, today's lecture, we're going to address the question, what, is, what kind of nuclear property allows us to distinguish the signal from different molecules? And in the end, um, we'll address the question, what is NMR spectroscopy or MR spectroscopy, as we um, call it in, in vivo in, in the biomedical imaging field. So first, some examples uh, from MRI between fat and water. So here is an image on the left, a normal T1 weighted image. And one thing that you notice there that's highlighted is the retrobulb of fat. So this behind the eyeballs, these are the eyeballs. Here's the optic nerve. We have fat deposits that's called the retrobulb fat. On the right hand side is an image where with some techniques that we will discuss today, the signal from the fat has been suppressed. And so the retrobulb fat is gone, but also this hyperintense lesion here is gone as well, which identifies it as a lipoma and not a malignant cancer. Here's from the trunk is an image, the original image. Here's a fat only scan. So there's some abdominal fat. The most of the fat is at the surface. And this is the water only image. And here are some additional examples. Here again, the original image, the fat-only image, and the water-only image. Here's an example from an important example, uh, an application to MRI of the breast. On the left is the normal image, and on the right side is the fat-suppressed scan. And so uh, there's a lot of fat in this organ, but you can see here this hyper-intense signal here, that's just a water signal, and that's a lesion. So malignant lesions, that's a cancer, are typically not containing fat. Um, here's another example, that's a fatty liver. The liver looks fairly normal, but if one looks at the composition, there are signals here, the resonances from water, and from the lipid resonances, fat resonances, there is mild, moderate to severe fatty liver, and these signals change. So they allow, even if the image looks apparently normal, they, they allow to uh, just differentiate the chemical composition. So why is NMR spectroscopy so important for chemists or biochemists? Why does every department of biochemistry or chemistry buy its share of NMR equipment? So, what is the advantage of NMR? Well, for them, it's a routine tool. It allows non-destructive analysis of samples. So there are some examples here, wine in bottles. So based on the signal of deuterium, for example, you can distinguish a Bordeaux from Algerian wine. There's synthesis outcome control. Imagine you spend four years of your PhD synthesizing a molecule. You got your few milligrams and you want to characterize what you've synthesized. You don't want to use a destructive analysis technique. You want to do something that leaves the molecule intact. And that's where NMR comes in. Other applications include, but are not limited to, determination of protein structure in solution. For X-ray crystallography, you need crystals. You can do it in solution. Molecule dynamics, there's information molecule dynamics, and you can even follow reactions, chemical reactions in the test tube. So what the chemists or biochemists do, they have a sample, an Eppendorf with a solution, and they stick it into an M NMR magnet. Now, in contrast to MRI, here the axis is vertical. That's how they are built. And 
they will insert the sample into the magnet and then measure the signal. So from the signal, which is something like this, this is a compound that's shown here. I don't even know what it is. Looks like it's got a porphyrin ring here. These are all the resonances, all the different compounds, uh, uh, nuclei, they give the rise to these different signals. Then you analyze the data. Here is a link between protons and C13. This gives information about structure of the protein. And this information is then used to determine, for example, the structure of things like these molecules of proteins. So you have some alpha helices here, some core and some uh, rings, um, some random structures here, but these are identified, these amino acid sequences here form very nice alpha helices. So that's become a, a very important tool because it can be done in solution. It allows to study molecule dynamics. And here's another example of a structure determined by NMR. And this work actually was pioneered by and large by Kurt Wüttrich, a biophysicist from Zurich, who received for his work the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry in 2002. Okay, so that's a bit to give you an idea why the chemists are excited. We'll end the course with some examples on what this does for tissue analysis. So let's go first back to the topic that we ended last week, and that is the question of what is the effect of relaxation on the magnetization as a function of time. So let's look at the effect of T1 and T2 on the signal. We have here the time axis, we will apply at this point an RF pulse, which induces a flip of the magnetization by alpha degrees. The flip angle here for a constant B1 is given by gamma B1 times tau. This is in radians. So the magnetization, if this we call this time T, and the time after the pulse, the flip angle alpha T plus tau, so the duration is tau. Then the Z magnetization after that pulse is MZ of T times cosine alpha. And the transverse magnetization that we obtain at this point is equal to the longitudinal magnetization, mz, before the pulse times sine alpha. Just a conversion of longitudinal magnetization along z into the transverse plane. So and we'll call this mxy of zero here in agreement with this. The effect of T2, we've dealt with this. This is modeled empirically as a simple exponential decay with decay constant T2. So this is what the signal would look like. So after the pulse, the magnetization decays with exponentially with T2. That's T2 relaxation. Now let's assume we call this time point here, the Z magnetization at this time point, MZ of zero, just some kind of Z magnetization that we have at this time point. Then what happens? in this time period, and this time period has essentially two nomenclature that we'll use in the course. TR, we've already talked about that last week, repetition time, or TI, and we'll deal with that, that's called inversion time, we'll deal with that today. So, and in this period, because here we have Z magnetization, in this period, the magnetization from the nuclei, the net magnetization, um, its change is essentially governed or exclusively governed by T1 relaxation. So the effect of T1, we have the differential equation here, which is not as simple as this one that we had, but I'll give again the solution for this. This is the general solution for this differential equation. We have MZ of zero at this point and MZ of T. So after this time T here, is then given by this expression. And you can verify that this is, a, is the correct solution by plugging it into this. And this equation here is what we call longitudinal coherence. So let's look at some examples. Actually, at one example, we'll assume that, we'll assume that the Z magnetization at time zero is the magnetization, Z magnetization after an RF pulse that induced the flip angle alpha. So mz of zeros, we assume it's the thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization times cosine alpha. That's what we had here. That's the effect conversion of the Z magnetization by the RF pulse. 
And so if we plug this into this equation, we're getting this term here. That's the Z magnetization at time T. If this is the just after the RF pulse at time T, the Z magnetization is given by this term here. And this is the MZ of zero um, plugged in here. Okay, so what does longitudinal coherence mean? Or what do we, it's important to take back here, aside from the solution, the equation that we have here framed. It's really that for the longitudinal coherence, due to this term here, so that the effect of the magnetization at time Z magnetization at time T depends also on the Z magnetization at time zero. And this magnetization, you can easily verify, depends on what you've done to the Z magnetization with prior RF pulses. So as a summary here, or as, or as an important statement, is that the effect of T1 on the signal depends on what we have done to the Z magnetization with prior RF pulses. And that's why it is called longitudinal coherence. That's why we're talking about something, there's, there's a sort of a, I wouldn't call it a memory effect, but what we have done to the magnetization in the five minutes beforehand, that's an exaggeration, but let's say in the 10 seconds or 20 seconds before this RF pulse influences this term here and therefore it influences this term here. Okay, so T1 is obviously an important parameter. So let's look at um, how we can optimally measure T1. What are the best parameters? T1, you might remember, is determined by something happening on the molecular level, molecular fluctuations, so it is a tissue parameter. So, um, what are the optimal conditions to measure this T1? And here I will introduce the term inversion recovery, and you'll see in a few minutes why. This is essentially a multi-pulse experiment with two RF pulses. So multi here is really two. And it is the usual experiment to measure T1. And usually the flip angle alpha is equals to pi. So alpha here, but I'll just draw it right now in general. So we just say we do an RF pulse with a flip angle alpha. We wait the time that we will call TI. That's an experimental parameter. And after TI, we convert the Z magnetization that is present here into transverse magnetization by applying a pi half pulse. So we, we do an entire rotation from along Z into the transverse plane. That's a way to measure the Z magnetization. So that's really what this pulse here only does. Its only role is to convert the Z magnetization into transverse magnetization. Okay, so we get the measured signal now. I'll take the equation from the previous slide. Instead of T, I'll write TI. I'll leave time zero, the Z magnetization here as MZ of zero. So from here to here, this is the evolution of the Z magnetization. Now the magnetization of time zero after this pulse, we'll assume here we start with equilibrium magnetization is M zero times cosine alpha. And now we'll plug this back in into the equation. So now we get a Z magnetization after time Ti is equal to this term here. Here's the cosine alpha, the equilibrium magnetization. Okay, now let's assume this experiment. We wait so that we have thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization. Then we apply an alpha pulse. Then we wait Ti seconds. Then we convert the, the longitudinal magnetization into the transverse plane with a 90 degree rotation. That's the pi half pulse. And so the question is, what is the optimal time uh, choice of alpha for measuring T1? Or in other words, we're actually not measuring T1, but what is, to be more precise, what is the optimal choice of alpha to be the most sensitive to changes in T1? And there we'll take the approach that we have used several times in this course that I introduced in the first lecture. We'll first take the partial derivative of the Z magnetization with respect to T1, that's calculated here, and we'll call this function, define it as F. So that what F is, is basically a measure of how sensitive is the Z magnetization to changes in T1. Okay, it's just a derivative. And now we want to know at what point is this derivative maximal? Because that's where the signal, the Z magnetization, is most sensitive to changes in T1 or to different T1s. 
And to determine that point, we'll just take the derivative now with respect to alpha, the experimental parameter. Solution is here. And this gives us, as a solution, the derivative has to be zero. This gives us a solution of sine alpha equals zero. So we have two solutions, essentially. Alpha equals zero. That's a meaningless experiment, because then we just measure m0. If we don't do anything here, we start with m0. We don't do anything here, we'll just measure m0. So the next point zero is when alpha equals pi. That's 180 degree um, flip. So the z magnetization, equilibrium magnetization is along z. If I do a rotation by 180 degrees, the z magnetization is now equals m0 along minus z. And that's why it's called inversion. We're inverting the magnetization. In terms of spin populations, you just swip, switch the populations between two energy levels if you prefer the quantum mechanical explanation. So our signal that we measure here with this, an alpha pulse, a delay, delay of Ti, and then a pi half pulse is maximally sensitive to changes in T1 if the alpha pulse is an inversion pulse. And that's why it's called inversion recovery because of the inversion pulse and recovery because during TI, the magnetization recovers towards the equilibrium magnetization. Okay, so in this case, let's assume we are doing a 180 degree pulse. In this case, you can verify that MZ of TI is equals to M0 times one minus two times e to the minus ti over t1. That's this expression here. That's just plugging minus one in here. So one minus one. Minus one gives us two, so it's one minus two. That's simple. Okay, so now we have another parameter, and that is, what is the optimal choice of ti to detect changes in t1? We've already determined alpha should be 180 degrees. We still have one experimental parameter that we can choose here, that's Ti. So what is the optimal Ti? And essentially we'll take the same function here, this which gives us the sensitivity of the Z magnetization to T1. But now we'll take, we want to know where's the maximum with respect to the experimental parameter T, the delay T here. Okay, just put small t here instead of Ti, but what is meant is this time duration here. Okay, we'll do the derivative here. We get these expressions. I'll spare us the pain of going through this. But now we've got a term here that um, everything is non-zero. This is non-zero. This is non-zero because it's um, 180 degrees. This is non-zero. So we want to set this equals to zero. And this gives us, lo and behold, the not so surprising solution that if we choose the Ti to be equals to T1, then we are most sensitive to changes in T1. And we'll see, we'll, um, in, in uh, two weeks, we will revisit this in terms of discussing how we modulate imaging contrast. So this is um, the optimal experiment. If one wants to see changes in T1, is 180 degree pulse here, then we wait T1 and convert that Z magnetization that we have at that point to transverse magnetization, and then our signal is most sensitive to changes in T1. Okay, so very often one is not interested in measuring um, changes in T1. Very often one is just interested in having the most signal. This is crucial if you have your expensive synthesized compound or even if you're just having your subject in the magnet and you want to get the maximum signal out of uh, the measurement. So let's consider uh, the situation here. We're gonna apply alpha flip angle pulses, RF pulses, every TR seconds and we'll apply them n times. Okay, alpha can be any flip angle, TR can be any time, and N is just some integer number, uh, typically substantially bigger than one. And now the question is, under what condition is the transverse magnetization maximal? Because that's the signal that we are measuring. 
Okay, and now here we're interested in calculating the optimum flip angle alpha as a function of the repetition time TR. So those are our, our two experimental parameters. So here we have an RF pulse with flip angle alpha. Here we have it again. We'll call this magnetic transverse magnetization here MXY0. And the spacing between the RF pulses here this time we will call that TR, repetition time. Why it's not RP, I don't know. Well, that's the nomenclature. Now, one thing that we will assume, because T2 typically is much shorter than T1, that we have no transverse magnetization present in the sample after TR seconds. So we'll assume that our signal here, our FID, has decayed to zero relatively fast and before we apply the next RF pulse, the only magnetization that we deal with is C magnetization or longitudinal magnetization. Okay, so we'll come back with the solution to our differential equation. That's the general solution. And now we will look at what happens after the nth TR. So we've applied the our N RF pulses and we will call the Z magnetization immediately after this RF pulse. So let's say this is the nth RF pulse. Could be the third, could be the 15th, could be the 2000th or the 15,000th. Believe me, we go up to 100,000. Um, we'll call the Z magnetization that's right after the, this RF pulse. We'll call that MZ equals MZ of N. Okay, so then we have N is just to indicate the index here. After the flip angle alpha, we have, so I'm sorry, this is actually Z magnetization just before the RF pulse here. After the, this one here, I'm sorry, I really messed it up here. So MZ of N is the Z magnetization just after the nth TR period. This is the N plus first RF pulse alpha. After this flip angle, the Z magnetization, which I will call MZ of zero here, is given by the Z magnetization before times cosine alpha. Same thing as we dealt with the previous slide. Now, after T1 recovery, so we'll wait this TR seconds here. I will call now the Z magnetization after these TR seconds. This is MZ index N plus 1, because we've waited N plus 1 TR now. And we'll plug in now the MZ of 0 solution in here, and we're getting this term here. You can verify that you just, when you put this in here, that you're getting this term here. I've just regrouped the TR over TI, the exponent here in the back. So that is our MZ of N plus one. Okay, and here um, regrouping it once more in another form, then this is more similar to this solution here because that's MZ of zero. Now, after, you can envisage that after 10,000 pulses, that you will not be able to distinguish the Z magnetization before the nth pulse or the n plus first pulse. And that's a condition that we now introduce, the so-called steady state condition or equilibrium condition. So the hypothesis is made here is after a, a, a significantly high amount of RF pulses, the Z magnetization will always recover after TR seconds to the same value, irrespective of the number of RF pulses. One can actually show by explicit calculation that this happens, but we'll just assume it now. So what does this assumption mean? This means that MZ of N plus one is equals MZ of N. So the Z magnetization prior to this RF pulse and prior to this RF pulse is the same. That's the steady same condition. And we will just simply call it MZ. So we'll forget about the index N here. And so we will set now mz of n plus 1 here, that's this term, equals to um, mz of n. And we'll set mz of n to equals to mz. And then we'll, we'll just move the, some terms over here. And we can solve now for mz. Okay, so we'll, we've just taken mz, set equals to mz of n plus one, which is this term, regroup the terms here so that we have mz on the left-hand side. I'm just skipping a few 
steps in calculation here, and then solve for mz. And we're getting this term here that says the Z magnetization prior to the RF pulse is proportional to M0, depends on TR over T1, and depends on the flip angle that we use. Now, for the signal, which is what we're interested in, in this case, we have to take the Z magnetization and multiply it by sine alpha, because we convert it into transverse magnetization. Alpha is a given parameter. So our MXY here is given by MZ times sine alpha. So I multiply this by sine alpha, and here is the solution. So this solution says, um, basically gives us a relationship between two experimental parameters and the signal that we can obtain. It says the signal is proportional to terms that depend on the flip angle and the, the repetition time relative to T1. Okay, so how does this dependence actually look like? So we have TR, T1, and flip angle alpha. And here are some plotted graphs. So if we take TR over T1 very long, so basically between the RF pulses, TR is 10 times T1, we have full recovery to equilibrium magnetization. Then we have the maximum signal, MXY relative to the thermodynamic equilibrium magnetization, is one here, and it's the maximum is at 90 degrees. That's not surprising, that's just when we wait forever for relaxation to occur. And even if TR over T1 is equals to five, that is still the case. And that makes sense because e to the minus five is 0 0.01. So basically, we're fully recovered after five times the decay constant. Then we have, then we can see here if we plot this function for the other times that the, the curve starts to look differently from these two. And as a reminder here, I am just plotting the previous equation here in this graphic here. That's just taking this equation, put it into Excel and plot it. Okay, so now what we notice here is the maximum that we have here for the flip angle of the horizontal axis is dependent on TR over T1. There's for every curve, there is a maximum. I've tried to plot it out here. And this maximum we call the Ernst angle, or alpha E is the symbol here. So if we plot now this optimal flip angle, so what this just basically says, if we choose for whatever reason, to use a TR over T1 of a certain value, you have here uh, seven values plotted, then the optimal flip angle that one should use depends on that TR over T1. And it goes, gets smaller and smaller the faster one pulses compared to T1. And now we can look at this maximum and we'll do the derivative of this function relative to alpha to determine the maximum. Okay, so we'll take the derivative of this relative to alpha to find out where these maxima, maxima are exactly. And I'll spare you the algebra or the math to do this. It's a happy derivation exercise, but the solution is simple. So it basically says that the Ernst angle, the alpha E, the cosine of that is equal to E to the minus TR over T1. So again, alpha E is the Ernst angle. And if we plot now the Ernst angle, this optimal flip angle as a function of TR over T1, and note here this is a logarithmic scale, then this is what it looks like. So it means for have optimal sensitivity, optimal signal, one needs to have an idea of how fast one is pulsing relative to the T1. That defines the flip angle that one uses. And with this equation here, one can calculate what that flip angle is. Fortunately, it's a very simple equation today. And actually for this work, among others, um, which was mostly done in the 60s, Richard Ernst, um, a physical chemist also from Zurich, received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1991. So it was very fundamental to discover these relationships, um, to establish them early on. So um, that's for optimizing the 
sensitivity of the experiment. So we have choice of flip angle, choice of TR. This depends on what is the T1. We have really only, we're only dealing with one tissue parameter, but we have two experimental parameters that do not make sense to optimize separately. If you use a TR that's very long, you waste a lot of time. If you pulse very fast with a big flip angle, then you are, if you take a big flip angle, you pulse very fast, that's the red line here, you get essentially no signal at this point. Okay, so, for the, now we'll switch a bit gear, we'll leave the longitudinal coherence and optimization of sensitivity. The relationships, uh, the solution to the differential equation, we will revisit that in two weeks. And what I want now to cover for to the rest of today's lecture is the reason why the chemists, and to some extent also biomedical researchers, are so excited about NMR. And the question here is, what does, how does chemistry come into play? We're looking at a nuclear property. We're looking at nuclear magnetization. It's the nucleus, but yet we can actually infer from the NMR signal um, properties of the surrounding chemistry. Okay, and I'll stick here with the proton. This is not limited to the proton or the nucleus of the hydrogen atom but we'll stick here to that one. That's our favorite um, proton. That's our NMR signal. Now the hydrogen atom is a proton plus an electron cloud. If we take an isolated hydrogen atom, this is fairly symmetric. We've got the nucleus here and we've got the electron cloud, the electron here swirling around. Now, if we look at the resonance frequency of the pure proton, then we have the Larmor equation which says that the Larmor frequency, the frequency of precession of that magnetization of that proton is equal to gamma B0. That's the Larmor equation. Or the omega L is the Larmor frequency. Now I'll redraw here the hydrogen atom with its electron cloud. And now we'll introduce the B0. So we've taken that hydrogen atom, we're sticking it into a magnet. Now what happens? Something happens to the electron cloud. And that something is, let's say, very difficult to describe in an ab initio calculation. There are some pretty good calculations out there, but I will give you here the cartoon version of this, what is happening. Essentially, you can think of it as the electrons they are moving around the nucleus, they have non-zero speed. Now you introduce a magnetic field. It makes, it's, it's reasonable to propose that the trajectories of the electron, of the electron that's surrounding the hydrogen nucleus is altered by the magnetic field. After all, it's a charge that moves. And actually what happens is that the electron cloud rearranges its con configuration. So the probability of where the electron is in such a way that it typically ends up producing a magnet, local magnetic field that opposes the main magnetic field. Okay, it's, it's similar to Lenz's rule. You got something that changes the magnetic field. It'll, op it'll oppose what's happening. So in this case, the mechanism behind it is a rearrangement of the electron cloud with, in general, not always, sometimes it goes the other way, but let's just stick to this, that as a result of the induced ex ex external magnetic field, B0, the electron cloud changes the local magnetic field by a delta B, which we will express here kind of equals to delta B0. Now this small delta here means is a scalar term, a very small term, and B0 is the external magnetic field. So it's proportional to the external magnetic field. So as a result, this nucleus here will no longer see the same magnetic field. So its Larmor frequency or its precession frequency is no longer the same. So to recap, the reorientation of the electron cloud in the magnetic field results in a small magnetic field at the nucleus, at the position of the proton, and this changes the 
equation of motion here. So now we have, instead of gamma B0 for the Larmor equation here, we have gamma times one plus delta or minus. Don't get me hung up on the minus. These are in physics fudge parameters. Depends on how you define it. But it's just an old, it's not exactly the free proton anymore. And so now the precession frequency of the magnetization is equal to the Larmor frequency of the free proton times one plus this term delta. That is a change in the precession frequency. So it's a shift of the precession frequency. Because that shift comes from the electron cloud, it is called chemical shift. So in full terms, what it means, it's the chemical shift of the resonance frequency of or precession frequency of the magnetization. Okay, so how does this now reflect chemistry? And so we'll now look at the consequence of having nearby electronegative atoms, such as oxygen, chloride, etc. So what they do is, again, in simple terms, an electronegative atom attracts electrons, it takes the electrons away, and that, as a result, produces a lower electron density at the site of the nucleus that we're investigating, so at the site of the proton. And the result of that is a de-shielding of the hydrogen nucleus. Here, it's the electron cloud acts as a shield. It reduces the magnetic field. Okay, I'll give this in cartoon version. So here is my isolated hydrogen atom. There is the electrons. So that's just the hydrogen electron cloud. In this case, and now we will take an OH group. So here's the oxygen, here's the hydrogen. And since oxygen is very electronegative, it steals essentially the electron. So from the hydrogen and the electron from the hydrogen is mostly, most of the time, at the site of the oxygen. So this, electron, this hydrogen atom here, in terms of electron cloud, is almost like a pure hydrogen nucleus or a pure proton. This is, of course, an ex ex exaggeration, but due to the lack of electrons here, there's little shielding, so this delta B is much smaller. So that's the OH group, and now if you take a CH group, which is carbon is not so electronegative. The situation here is essentially the carbon still lets the hydrogen have its electron. It's a little bit of a shift of the electron cloud towards the carbon. So we have still much of the electron um, distribution function here is close to the hydrogen. So we have more shielding in this case. Okay, so if we now look at the three cases, we have here the hydrogen atom with a symmetric electron cloud. We have here an OH group where the electron is on the, on the oxygen. So we have little shielding, so we have a higher resonance frequency or precession frequency for the proton that's in the hydrogen here. Whereas here, we have almost all of the electron residing close to the hydrogen, we have more shielding, and so we have a lower precession frequency or resonance frequency for the hydrogen that's in a CH bond. Okay, so this is the chemical shift. The chemical environment depends, uh, influences the electron cloud. The electron cloud influences the shielding effect of the electrons in the external magnetic field. And from this shift in resonance frequency, this chemical shift, one can distinguish different chemical species. Okay, so I'll, I'll revisit um, electronegativity, the, the, the relationship here. And this is just a very uh, arbitrary example here. But these are some compounds. These are CH3 groups with a compound X. So we have the different compounds X, fluorine, oxygen, chlorine, bromide, iodine, hydrogen and silicon. This is the catalogued electronegativity of these compounds, and this is the measured chemical shift that has been reported. 
And if one now plots these two variables against each other, one can see that there is a correlation between the two, but it's not like a straight line or so. So chemical shift is not a measure of electronegativity. But I'm just showing this here to reinforce the notion that the distribution of the electron cloud affects the resonance frequency of the nucleus, and this has a lot to do with um, electronegativity, which is another way of expressing where the electrons are. So this is the chemical shift. Now you notice here I introduced, without much comment, the unit for chemical shift, which is a dimension loss parameter in parts per million. Now parts per million is used for, was it in smog, right? That's where you use parts per million. Well, here it's actually has nothing to do with that kind of definition. It is really a measure of the chemical shift expressed as, in a, as a fraction of the main magnetic field or the Larmor frequency with respect to a reference compound. And a typical reference compound is tetramethylsilane, TMS, for protons. And so the chemical shift is a dimensionless parameter expressed in PPM. Basically, it just says, we stick a reference compound into our sample. We will measure the frequency of the compound of interest, the omega here, subtract from it the reference frequency, multiply this by a million, hence parts per million, and divide it by the Larmor frequency of the reference compound. So that gives us now the expression of the chemical shift, the shift in frequency that is um, dimensionless, it's in units of parts per million, and most important, it does not depend on what instrument that you use. Because you divide by this, you're dividing also by B0, so it's scaled. Everything here is proportional to B0. This is proportional, this is proportional, this is proportional. So now the chemical shift, the resonance frequency expressed in these units is independent of whether it's a 2 Tesla, 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, 7 Tesla, or a 22 Tesla magnet. Okay, and these are for a number of compounds, the different distributions, the chemical shifts. Here is zero for TMS, tetramethylsilan. You've got some compounds here, and these are all the different hydrogen groups where they are typically situated. So these are, I think this is a phenol ring. Um, I don't know what these things are. There's typically the, uh, some of the resonance is linked to the, uh, what are they called? Guanidine, GC, so on, AT, what you have in DNA, I forgot what the names are but they have resonances that are in this range, some of the resonances, but they also have resonances in this range. Most of the amino acids in proteins will be here. Um, we have here, but we have also resonances from things like glutamate, glutamine, or phenylalanine in there. Um, and here are the most elect least electronegative compounds are here. Okay, that is so much for the first half of today's lecture.